Hi everyone, it's me, Tim, and today I want to talk about building tools. Shady Desperado 2590 asks, I have a lot of questions about building tools for other developers and teammates. What's that process like? What do the various tools look like for different departments? What problems can they cause and how can they be avoided? That is a set of good questions. I will try to answer them here. Um, you're asking a lot of different questions at once, but I think I can answer them both at a high level and by using examples of games I worked on where I didn't work on the tools and then games I worked on where I did and what I learned from that. So let me start with like two really high level things that I think are super important for anybody on a team, but especially whoever's making the tools. The first one is, you should know other disciplines besides your own. I've said this in other videos about, I I like working better with designers who can code because they, they, they often lead to making designs that are codable, where occasionally you will have a designer put features in their game that are easy, either really hard to code or really car, hard to code efficiently, or just a mess to code, where with a slight change to the design, it's really easy to code, really easy to keep debugged, and delivers the same experience to the player. I've said that about learning to code for artists. If artists know how their models are actually being rendered in the game, they can often make art that is faster or looks better than if they have no idea what happens when it leaves their computer. This is true for programmers as well. I've found that when programmers know how assets are being made in the game, they make way better tools. In fact, they, they make way better code. Uh, graphics programmers who know how models are textured and rigged and uh, a animated make better tools for that. The same way that if once a scene is put together and they're required to write some pixel shaders, understanding Stuff about how the art, the scene is done in art really informs the pixel shaders they're going to make. So because of that, I always feel like people should be not super generalist, but at least attempt to be cross-disciplinary. Understand things from other disciplines, even if you're not good at doing it. I'm terrible at art, but I tried to understand it. I don't script frequently, but I dug, I dug deep into it. I did write dialogues, and I wrote them poorly, but I learned how to write better dialogue tools, both from trying to write dialogue and from looking at the dialogues that other people wrote. Which leads me to the second thing that I think is important for anyone making a tool, which is, I've heard it called, eat your own dog food. I'm sure if you've used any of the popular game engines, let's not name them, but if you've used them, you know what I'm about to say, you will often be using those game engines to doing something for your game, whether you're making a UI or scripting or putting in lots of data for lots of different similar game objects. And at one point you have to stop and just go, did anybody at that company actually make a commercial level game with this? Because this process is agonizing. Sometimes even on the biggest game engines, I've been led to believe by using the engine that they may have made a simple demo or a demonstration of how to do that feature, but they've never actually made a commercial game with it. Because once you make a hundred different interfaces or thousands of objects, and you're trying to fix things that are common to all of them, or search them for some particular element you use, and you discover you just really can't do that, it makes you go, yeah, these people never use this. They, they never did anything with this. So once we get past that, I'm gonna assume you're attempting to learn the discipline of the tool you're making and that you actually use the tool. Those two things, you could ignore everything else I say here and those two things will go a far way, a long way to you making a great tool. But now let me talk about some experiences I had on making tools. I'll talk about, let me talk about going from Fallout to Arcanum. Now, if you know the history of that, Fallout was made at Interplay and so when a few of us left and we were all going to just get jobs somewhere and we decided to make a company instead, we had to remake all the tools. Now, during the making of Fallout, 
I didn't make a single level, nor did I even make World Ed, the um, the or the the editor for putting together maps. However, during the making of the game, I heard a lot of people complain about things that those <clears throat> that editor made difficult. For example, the way people had to put together the isometric maps is you had to, the art got cut up into slices of walls and tiles, but there was no indication of how they would go together. So whoever's making the map had to grab a tile and then look on a little strip at the bottom, look and grab a tile and see if it connected. And sometimes they look like they would, but then you put them next to each other and the pixels don't match up and you have to do it again and again and again. Similarly with the walls, you put down one wall and you go put up another and you're like, oh, that doesn't quite fit. Let me go find another wall strip. That took a lot of time and made making maps that should have been pretty simple and straightforward take hours or days instead of seconds or minutes. So when I made the world editor for Arcanum, I made it so that you could spray down tiles of any type, water, shallow water, deep water, sand, grass, rock, anything you wanted. And it would automatically do several things. It would transition it to connect correctly to all the tiles around it. And it would select random variations on those tiles. And if you didn't like them, you could always click and redo it. But it made making, first of all, the base of the map trivial and fast. Wanted to do the same thing for buildings. So we made a top-down view that you could just draw a rectangle and it would insert all the walls, corners, everything. And then when you went back to isometric, there were all the wall strips done correctly and it would put a roof on it because it was part of, part of a wall roof window door set that the artist could put together. If you wanted to make a window, there was a key you could press and just click on a wall segment and it would put a window there. If you put a window right next to it, it would just make a longer window. So you could make bigger windows and smaller windows very easily. Same thing with doors, or I should say doorways. Um, you could click and put a door, a doorway and plop a door in it. You could widen it by putting a door right next to it. You could change out what kind of door was used there. Very easy, very fast. Similarly, I didn't make the scripting language or, or the editor or even scripted in Fallout. But, wow, did I fix a lot of bugs related to scripts. So, again, when we started Arcanum, before we even wrote one script or even anybody thought about it, I already designed out Sock Monkey Script Maker, which I've shown in another video. It was the Arcanum scripting editor and scripting language. They were highly, highly constrained. You could not, first of all, you could not write a syntactically incorrect Sock Monkey script because you, you didn't actually write anything. You selected from drop-down menus the actions and conditionals you wanted to check. It was very difficult to make infinite loops, although I underestimated the tenacity of some script writers to create bugs, and there were ways by using multiple scripts to create infinite loops. But even then, I put in a simple script call counter and eventually managed to prevent them from crashing the game. But what this meant was People could script just as fast, if not faster, in Sock Monkey than in Fallout. But their scripts were unlikely to have as many bugs in them. And if they were, they were purely semantic bugs. They were bugs in not doing what they were supposed to do. They weren't bugs in referencing a bad object or um, having a syntax error or having an infinite loop. So that saved us a lot of time in... Arcanum, both time on the front end creating all those scripts and time on the back end debugging them. Similarly, I didn't write any of the dialogues in Fallout and very few of them in Arcanum. But again, I saw a lot of bugs in Fallout's dialogue. And in addition to bugs, I saw a lot of memory wastage. I saw a lot of strings being reused or almost being reused. So... There were so many places in Fallout where you would ask, you would try to bribe someone, but it was all written in different ways, which meant all these strings had to be stored, which used up memory. They had to be loaded, which was time. They had to be translated, which was time and money. So that just made me go, oh. So this is what led to me writing generated dialogue for Arcanum, which is another video you can go see. 
I'll put links to these in the bottom, and I promise I will remember to put those links in. But generated dialogue on Arcanum meant it was easy to throw in a quick bribe subtree, vendor, vending subtree, insult subtree, ask for help subtree, ask about the story state subtree. All the ones I mentioned in there were easy to put in. There were variations that they could write and put in one place. So they didn't always say, the NPCs didn't always say the same thing, but you could control how much variation there was, which lets you get some control over the localization costs. And believe me, these are things that let Arcanum, which is a much, much bigger game than Fallout, be made in the exact same amount of time with about a third as many people. So that was all tools. I put that all on tools. So again, let me just sum up how to build a good tool. Know who will use the tool and how they will use it. And if that means using it yourself, great. Then build a tool that lets them do the common things they do very easily and quickly. Because those are the things that are done most often. Those should be the fastest things to do. Also, try to make the tool so it reduces the amount of mistakes they could possibly make. So it could reduce how much memory they use. And any other issues you can try to build in to the tool to steer people away from doing bad things. They will still find ways of doing bad things. People are people. But if you can, re if you can do this, if you can know how the tool will be used, make, make it so the common stuff is fast and easy and the buggy stuff or memory hoggy stuff is hard, you will go a long way to not only having a tool that people like using, but a tool that saves you time and money making your game. I hope that answers your question, Shady Desperado. And I hope for everyone else it makes them rethink how much effort they're putting into their tools because a little effort on the tools saves you a lot more effort later on.